Hello! Welcome to another episode of Women in Power. Today we have a very special guest and I have known her for a long time. I bet you'll recognize her voice because over three decades, my friend has given voice to a spiky-headed 10-year-old boy, even though she's a grown woman. If you haven't figured it out yet, yes, Nancy Cartwright is the voice of Bart Simpson. She's also responsible for an array of other characters on The Simpsons. And in 1992, Nancy won a primetime Emmy for Outstanding VoiceOver. And now, releases a new audiobook. I'm still a 10-year-old boy. And it's exclusively on Audible. So I can't wait to welcome her to the show and pick her brain about her new book and just dive into what it's like having a 30 year career. Let's go. Welcome Nancy Cartwright. Woo! <laughs> Hi Elena. Hello, thank you so much for being on Women in Power. I can't wait to catch up with you. I've just told everyone how, you know, I've been bragging, dropping names, right? Uh, how long we've known each other and how long we've been friends. Actually, I didn't even tell him this, but when I was considering having a home birth, you were one of two people that I contacted with, went over to your house. You were like so encouraging and I am so grateful that I went in that direction and was able to have a home birth thanks to you and Denise Duff who just really <laughs> safe pointed the whole experience. That's probably too much information, but that's how close we are, okay? Um, but I, I, yeah, see, I, I see you're up to so much right now. So I guess we'll yeah. just take one thing at a time. The first is, let's just talk about Mr. Bart Simpson who's actually 30, what, 30 years old? 30, like in our, 34 years old? Yeah, he's coming in, yeah. He, we're, we're, we're just starting our 34th season with Disney now. That is unbelievable. This is the longest running scripted show on television. Yeah, that's right. And like most people who come from the entertainment world know how difficult that is to have a job that like lasts for a year. Like that's like a blessing, but 34 years. You just wake up every day like, wow, this is unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. pretty much. That's incredible. Pretty much. I Yeah, my body looks like a Rand McNally map of the universe. If people can remember when we used to use maps and stuff, but uh, or guides because of all the different colors of pinching myself and the bruising. But um, yeah, it's pretty unbelievable that we've been been around that long, you know, including the Tracy Ullman show. So it's pretty remarkable. Yeah. Super congratulations on that. Thank you. And Thank I see you. that you just, well, first of all, you do so many things. Like you're an artist, you're majorly into your philanthropic endeavors. Now you're a director, you've written scripts. Now you just wrote a book, an audible yeah. book, right? Yeah, that's right. So before we get into the audible book, which I'm dying to hear about, because I like the little topics you talk about in it. <laughs> how do you have time? You know, like there's a lot of moms out there, a lot of just women out there, period, who are like, how do I have time? You're, you're a mother, you're yeah. a working woman, you do all these other things. Like just, how do you do it? Yeah, time management is a tricky thing. I kind of kind of see it like um, the Ed Sullivan show. Remember, I, my, the guy that spun all the plates and he would have to go back to the beginning and spin this again and go down the aisle by the time he got to the 10th plate. The one at the beginning was starting to fall. He had to quick run back and that's kind of how I feel, feel it is because yeah, I've got three organizations, three companies and um, the thing that I, and still doing Bart Simpson, and I do also Rugrats, we're back after a 16 year hiatus and all the original actors are back, or actresses that play the babies are back. And it's all been modernized and set today. So there's contemporary things about that. But you know, the things that I do, I just have to, I mean, I could spend all day painting or spend all day sculpting or be with my granddaughter all day and do that, but I'm not going to get much done. So it's a matter of kind of like um, cart compartmentalizing what it is that I do so I can give myself enough time to do a little bit of this, a little bit of this, a little bit of this. And 
I don't know. I just try to do the best I can. And the other thing that's that's probably senior to all of that is it takes a village to raise a Nancy Cartwright. <laughs> I'm surrounded by by other people and honestly, it's it's almost all women. It's almost all women that um, I have working with me. One of my partners in Create For You, which is a production company, um, is Jaime Emmerich and his wife, Carolina, and then there's Monica Gill and myself. We are the founders of this production company. And with the exception of Jaime, you know, the people that are around me are women and they're all kind of propping me up and flowing me a lot of power. And in exchange for that, I give them chances and opportunities to grow and um, take leadership roles and put out fires and, um, yeah, kind of do that. Did you intentionally surround yourself by women or is this just what kind of you just discovered one day? Like, wow. Or did yeah. you consciously make a decision? No, I want to work around females. You know, it, it wasn't a conscious decision. It's just kind of like um, everybody that I met, the team that I have together now, some of them started in a different position and, and then they got promoted. And that was, that was amazing. But, the, but I saw that there was an ability there and I see it in, in some of these young gals that I have working with me. You know, they're production assistants one of the gals that works with me, believe it or not, I mean, it's during COVID, she was, she, she lost her job during COVID and ended up becoming a dog walker. And she was helping us with our, with my dogs. And in chatting with her, found out she has so many more skills than that. And mostly it was like having to do with IT and having to do with managing websites and her creativity and ability to go in and troubleshoot to fix things that I'm like, I'm like kind of a mess. I need an eight year old with me constantly in order to keep, <laughs> to keep my, to keep me up to date on what's the newest thing and how to fix that. I mean, you know, that with yep. your two daughters, they, they, probably know more than you in some areas. You say, I'm having trouble with this here. Can you fix it? Oh, mom, no problem here. Let it up. There you go. It's like giving them a Rubik's cube and they can do it in 30 seconds. You know, these kids are so smart, but that's kind of what I noticed with one of the gals that's working with me. And, you know, she's, she ended up, I, she said, that's it with the dog thing. You need to come work for me. She is such a happy person, so much happier now but like working with us and finding out she even has more skills and same even with, you know, you can find this out about anybody really. You can, and I think it's, I think COVID actually really helped with that. Yeah. You mean discovering the, yeah. Yeah. Um, that there's growth potential. Yeah, exactly. And when you say it takes a village for Nancy Cartwright, what are some of the qualifications that you look for that are a must um, at, that act as a filter for you uh, to allow them into your empire to work for you. Do you have one? Yeah, I do. Wh I do. There's different standards that I have. And the first one is that they are, um, that they have a passion and understand what my, what my personal goals are. You know, innately, I don't want to hurt anybody. Me too. I, I, I care. And I think, women do have, I mean, we're, men and women are, we're built different. I mean, electronically speaking, we have different auras around us. I don't know. It's the way our bodies are, are made up genetically. They're just, we're different. And that, not that <laughs> men don't have hearts. That's right. That's right. But we do have a, a, I think a little bit more of a sensitive side, a little bit more of a caring side, nurturing. I think it's kind of innately in us a little bit. Yeah, and you know, and I've heard or I've read too that labels are put on women for doing, for, you know, wearing the hat of an executive. Why is it that there's a, how do I say it? An executive does not have to be a bully. I think an executive with, with the right amount of effort and just 
just the right touch of, you know, caring that through any communication, you can still be an executive and not be labeled something where you don't have, in other words, you don't have to get harsh with someone. You don't have to be a bully and say, look, that's not what you were hired for. Da, da, da. I would never talk to somebody like that. Right. You know, and it's like through, through communication that you would get your point across and say, listen, you know what? We need to have a little sit down and I want to talk to you. Are you happy on your job? Are you happy with the way things are going? What is it that you see that you want to have happen? And then some truth, some more truth can be brought out of that conversation. Well, actually, I kind of, I really want to, um, I admire you so much. I want to be just like you. <laughs> so, what, well, so tell me a little bit more. Like, what do, what do you mean? Well, I would love to get high. I would love to do voiceover work. And I'd say, well, that's great. That's great. Well, okay. So this job, you know, in this job, you're going to learn a lot from me, but um, that's what this job, you're going to be a production assistant. And I don't know, I, I'm not talking about that other person that I was Right, that was you're giving an example of how you would handle yeah. it in a real life situation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we, we do that a lot in our companies too. It's, uh, you know, when there's sort of like a written policy with the mission statement of the company, which it sounds like you have for you. And then we're able to say, look, like, let's say, for instance, it's results oriented, but they're not calling people back and produce getting results. It's like, okay, look, remember, here's this. So what that allows us to do is to be able to sit down and have a conversation with somebody and say, look, here's this write up, this write up, this write up on you. This is where you were told to, to read a, like a, a guide or however we handle the situation here and it's still not handling it. So look, we love you. It's yeah, just, you see, yeah. it doesn't line up with our, with what your That's role right. is. And, and we have the role clearly labeled for them of what they're actually supposed to do and what they're supposed to achieve. So I found that once we got that into our companies, it made everything so much easier because it's not just, oh, they don't like me, they're being mean, they're discriminating, whatever. It's yeah. like, no, it's here, it's here. So I love that you do that too. Yeah, thank you, thank you. And Monica Gill, who's worked with me for 15 years, she's now the, the um, executive director of the company. And she's got, you know, it's interesting to, <laughs> She sees the overall strategy of the company. I mean, I see it too, but it really, my area really is in PR and it's me as an artist and it's me in doing my, continuing to be the artist and flourish and prosper. Mm. And I use the lines that I've had for like 42 years actually, Simpsons 30, 34, but I've been doing voiceovers for 42 years now because wow. I did You're not even that old, stuff. Nancy. <laughs> well, yeah. So, um, <laughs> yes, I, I play pickleball to keep up my, my girlish figure. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's amazing. But, okay. So did you finish what you were going to say on that? Well, I'm just saying like, she's the executive director of the company and each one of my partners, we all have our own divisions that we take care of and that we're responsible for. So at this point in time, it's just kind of a matter of, a, of all of us wearing our own individual hats and kind of keeping it like in our own lane yes. so that we're not bleeding That's over into is. somebody else's job, you know, yes. and let that person wear that hat and they let me wear my hat. And what's the most amazing thing, Elena, is that there, there is no crossover. Each one of our hats is very clearly defined and delineated. And we work together. I couldn't do what I do without them being there. So there is a the power that the power that I have and that I use is as great as the power that I am given, and that I can also give to them so that they can do their job. Does Love that make it. sense? Yeah. Oh no, it totally makes sense. I I take it one step further. I'm sure you do too, but I'm curious to know. Like I actually kind of model our personal life similarly to the way that we do our business where like even my friends have to pass certain qualifications now like the circle's tighter you know yeah. what i'm saying and and my yeah. friends have a role 
And there and 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 there's got to be some mutual exchange for the friends. Like I don't do a lot of loaf time anymore. The goals are so big now that it's like, I like loaf time exhausts me, Nancy. Like I can do maybe a couple of hours of it, and then I'm crawling the walls, or I'm like exhausted. You know what? I so understand what you're saying. I don't. For me, I don't know that it's exhausted. I get a little bit like, how do I say it? If the loaf time, it can be, it depends who it is, but sometimes I just, actually, you know what, you nailed it. I can start crawling the walls, walls because I feel like I should be doing something else. I, my work is not work. I, I don't know how to say Me it. Too. I love what I do. I Me love too. it so much. It's not, it's not work. I love the people that I work with. I love the people that I'm meeting. My connections with the studios these days and the executives in charge, production companies, showrunners, writers, um, developers. It's great affinity. And then when I go out to do a vacation, now listen, I'm like, I'm sure I'm like you. I love a good, I, I love a facial. I love doing some sports. I love doing some, some hand gliding, some like zip lining. That, that's I drive earned, to, earned loaf time, by the way, go on. Uh -huh. Yes, earned, earned loaf time, but I do it. I like to do it fast and furious. And I love surrounding myself, especially if I'm with a group of friends or a, a tight group of girlfriends that were all on the same page that way. But you know, when it's done, Four days for me is like, I love four day, a four day weekend and then back to work, you know? I'm the same I don't way. know that I could do a two, a, a month. I don't know that I could do a month vacation of just, I would feel no. like my life at this age that I am, especially and where I'm at, I am more creative now than I have ever been in my whole life. Me too. Escalated in an upward direction. Totally. Me too. That's why you create the time to do all this other stuff because you're, you're so focused on, oh, that's what you say in your book, by the way, I'm still in a 10 year old boy. You talk yeah. about doing what you love, which I do want to talk to you about because, because this, it's a good topic because sometimes people get so set and I like your spin on it, but sometimes I feel like people get so set on doing what they love, doing what they love that they don't realize that in anything that they do what they love, there's going to be parts of about it that you're going to not love to do certain parts of it. Is that, yeah. do you think that's fair in your, what you're doing? Do you love every moment, moment of it, every confrontation that you might have to have or sit down talk that you need to have with somebody or uh, do you love it all? Cause there, I don't, um, I don't love every aspect of what I do, but I love what I do for the most part. God, this is such a, nobody's ever asked me that question before, Elena. This is an amazing conversation that we're having. I'm not trying to, 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 to not answer the question. I'm really looking at it going, do I love every aspect of it? I, I got to tell you, I, I think I really do. I don't, by, by the way, though for me, and it may be different for you, and maybe that's why, is that I'm, I, I'm not in there with my attorney. I'm not working out deals with with major studios i'm not part of that hat my name obviously is getting there i contributed a lot to getting there in the first place but then i've got to just let them wear their hat and they do their job and they report back and tell me you know give me the good news or give me the news or like what's the next step because signing a contract if i can it's like the signing a contract is, do you see my hand above my head yes. right up here? Uh -huh. If that's the final thing that I'm going for is when the, when the contract is signed and the ink is dry, there are all these other steps that you have to take. And each one of those steps is a huge win. It feels incredible. It's like you've got these, um, I don't know what you would call them. Just they're, they're, if this is the final, um, it's the final goal. You've got these sub goals. The sub targets. Going, oh, That's what I call them. Yeah. The little sub targets sub that you hit along the way. Yeah. And so you hit one. Good. Let's ha let's have a special meal. Let's celebrate the win on that. Because I reached out to, so I'm just going to make it Ryan Reynolds. I'm just making it up. I reached mm -hmm. out to Ryan Reynolds and he responded. He wants to do another, you know, he would love to do an animated show with me. And I'm, like I said, I'm just making this up. This isn't true. No, I love but it. But that 
that's a sub product. We don't have a contract. But he's like, oh, yeah, oh, my God, I would love to work with Nancy Cartwright. Next thing you know, we're talking. We're, we are doing a, um, a FaceTime call or something. And, you know, I have an idea for you and me, blah, 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 blah. And that to me, but, but that's, that's, not, that's not up here. That's not a signed target. Now we've got to get a script. We've got to get agreement. And if it's a musical, that's a whole nother bag of tricks. Now it's pulling in somebody else that knows what he's doing in that area. Do I want to go to Broadway and pull in, you know, and, and do what um, uh, Central Park did and pulling in a lot of um, Broadway performers? You know, that, that's a way to go, and there's, there's other ways to go. I've got a, a great line in with Disney. And, you know, it's just kind of like 42 years in this business. There are a lot of, my, my Rolodex is pretty thick. Mm -hmm. No, I like it because you're inspiring me to delegate even more of the parts that I don't like to do to other people. Why do I think I have to do the parts oh, yeah. that I don't like? But there are parts that, yeah. that only I can do. Like, you know, there's certain things that I feel like I have to do. Um, maybe, maybe I do mentoring calls. I love the mentoring calls after I do them. Sometimes I have like, like mild for lack of a better word, like anxiety or like, oh, having to actually sit and write the content or come up with the idea and then oh. get on the call because I really want to be with Grant and the kids because they were doing popcorn in a movie. But now I have to go do the Zoom, which I'm really happy for because ultimately it was so good by the time it ends. But but I didn't love that. Or, you know, sometimes speaking in front of stages like I love it after it's done. But sometimes walking out, I'm like, oh, I hate the the thing, you know. Um, you know what? Yes, you just did. You, you, you kind of triggered or inspired me on a thought there. So if I get invited to speak at a like like um, yeah, keynote speech yes. or graduate. Yeah, yeah like I, I just did. Right? And now I can't go with my family to Cabo because it conflicts. But I'm not going to give yeah. up the other thing because I love the other thing. But tell me your thing. Yeah, well, it's kind of along that line. I, I'm going to enjoy... I don't necessarily like sitting down and spending four hours to write a 20 minute keynote speech, a commencement speech, because graduations are, you know, they're just around the corner. So I've been invited to do a keynote speech. I haven't confronted this yet, but I'm going to have to sit down. And I've done enough of these that I can go in and I saved dozens of speeches and I can clip and I can cut and paste and put it together. But when it comes right down to it, that's a particular public. We've gone through two years of being in, in you know, it, it, mandates are still in effect in some places. Thank but God I'm, I'm in Florida. Have, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I, I understand about Florida. California, things actually have lifted quite a bit in the past week. The, ma the mandates have lifted quite a bit. So that's amazing. But prior to that, sitting down and and the whole point I'm trying to make is maybe I've done a commencement speech before, but it still needs to be the way I want to say it. It needs to be tailored to that specific public. And that takes some time to do. Yeah. And that's not, that's not the funnest thing, but I'm so glad I did it when I'm standing and when I'm introduced and I'm standing in front of the podium, I'm so glad that I did it. And that's the difference that I keep trying to set in people's head because sometimes it's, do what you love, the money will follow. And yes, I agree with all of those statements. And I love that you put that, do what you love. And if you're not doing what you love, find some aspect of yeah. what you love. I love that you say that. And then also mm -hmm. like trying to either set my record straight or other people's record straight that yes, in doing what you love, it's not gonna be 100% every action is like, ah, yeah, you know, yeah. that, you know, and, and to not, like think that you're on the wrong path or something's wrong or think that you have to have this perfect picture of what it's supposed to look like and because you feel differently it's it's somehow not quite right or something you know like i like your description of the work life balance yeah no i think the the, the time management cuz i could identify with it so well 
and maybe it's because you're as busy as we are, but you're talking about the plates, you know, because people ask me all the time about work-life balance. How do you do work-life balance? And finally, I came up with it. I don't do balance. I do juggling, but I like your plates <laughs> analogy. I'm like, I catch whichever one is about to land and I can do multiple. It could be a golf ball, yeah. a jigsaw, a chainsaw, a basketball. <laughs> like I'm multi-talented. Like if you want the circus act juggler, you come to me, you know, <laughs> and I just do, I'm, I'm just constantly in motion. And for me, when when I have like nothing going on and I've I kind of have that humana humana, I'm in peace mode, like I get in trouble. I get in trouble. Mm. I'm gonna wanna pick a fight with my husband. Like I get bored, I get like like yeah. do, does that happen to you? Oh, and yeah. do you think that you know, happens you, to everybody? I think you hit it. The, you, uh, you get bored. If you don't mind my saying, because maybe we're similar this way, I'm a very action-oriented person. I'm very goal oriented. And if, if I don't have enough motion going on around me, I get bored instantly. Me too. And when boredom, and right. And when boredom sets in, watch out because then it's going to be trouble. Havoc. Then all of a sudden you start seeing things that are wrong and maybe criticism sets in. It's like, and then you're, the, you're sunk. <laughs> so <laughs> you're sunk and then you're going to be making some apologies. <laughs> I know. I know. Okay. Well, we covered that. I want to cover this, these other points that you talk about in your book. Well, in your Audible. How can they get the Audible? They go to Audible oh, and, and yeah, search. just audible.com. If you don't have a subscription, I don't, not sure. It's a pretty simple setup, but you can get a subscription. There's, they treat their, their customers so good. They do. You know, you can get it. And I mean, I've had books that I've, I've started to list some audio books that I've listened to. And, um, if I don't like it, I, I return it. And then you get, they, they do some kind of a token thing. It's really kind of an amazing setup, but yeah, it's just at audible.com, Nancy Cartwright, and it'll and, come uh, in. It's, I'm still a 13, I'm still a 10 year old boy. And, um, cause and I it's talk narrated about it. by you, of course, I'm yeah. assuming for sure. Okay. How yeah. could a voiceover professional <laughs> best in the industry <laughs> assign that task <laughs> to somebody else? That ain't happening. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I do touch in some things. I had come out with the book in the year 2000. It was a hardback book. And then in 2004, I self did, I self published it as a, an audio book. I don't know that a lot of people knew about it, but, but the book actually did really well. It earned out, which means it made its money, made a profit that it did really well. Well, 20 years, 22 years has gone by. And when I realized like how much more we've done with the Simpsons, you know, we got a star on Hollywood Boulevard. We played at the uh, Hollywood Bowl three nights, sold out, standing room only at the Hollywood Bowl. Wow. I got to sing Do the Bartman as the closing number with Weird Al Yankovic, Conan O'Brien, Beverly D'Angelo, 200 members of the LA Gay Men's Choir, and Nancy Cartwright singing, yo, what's happening, dude? I'm the guy with the rep for being rude. And they're all whoop, whoop, and they're all singing it along with me. That was like... <laughs> Super, milestone, super milestone. cool. Huh? <laughs> so I mean that and what else have we done? It's just like we've performed live at the Aspen, um, the Comedy Arts Festival in Aspen, Colorado. We were introduced and nobody had seen the actors before. And that was kind of a first. So that was really memorable. And, I, and so I talk about that. And also on the book, I've got little clips from Meryl Streep and J.K. Simmons and Kirk Douglas, Mickey Rooney and Marge and Homer and Lisa Simpson, the actors that play those parts and little clips from them. And I talk about episodes, you know, that they had mm. done. 50 Cent, um, Anne Hathaway. She ended up getting an Emmy because she performed on The Simpsons. Get playing out. <laughs> yeah. So that was pretty cool that we, we helped her out with that. So I talk about that. And one other thing that to me is, I still can't believe I did this, but my mentor was a name that you, you probably re don't know that you remember his name, but Dawes Butler, who is Huckleberry Hound and Yogi Bear and Quick Draw McGraw, Elroy Jetson. I've got some of his stuff, I think. There's uh, Snagglepuss over there in the far right. You can see a little animated cell right there of Snagglepuss. And anyway, he, um, he was my mentor when I was a teenager. And I would send him my voice on cassette 
and mail that. He, he would send me scripts and I would record that on a little cassette and mail that back to him. And he would critique me on another cassette and mail that to me. And I saved those over the years. What? How did I you manage them. that? You know, I, it's not like I thought when I was 18, 19, wow, when I'm in my, you know, when I'm about 30 something, I'm going to end up getting the, I'm going to get cast as a 10 year old boy and it's still going to be on the air 34 years later. It's not, but I just had a vision, Elena, that this was, I knew when I was about 16, that this is, this is what I'm going to do. And it was it was, uh, and I, I go into a lot of detail in the book on it. I, I, t I talk about it quite a bit. That's kind of what the book is about. I unfurl how I came to be the voice of Bart. Wow. And I got clips of Dawes Butler talking to like 18, 19 year old Nancy Cartwright and me wow. answering him. And you just, I don't even sound like myself. I certainly don't have the, um, Depth. How do I say the, the, the depth, the confidence at talking to even you right now, the certainty, because I've got all this history now behind me and I had, I'd never even been on an airplane. <laughs> I was super, super naive wow. to, to be honest, but I thought Dawes Butler, wow. And I made a decision. I want to, I want to meet him. I want to work with him. So did you have to pay for that or he just took a liking to you and he, yeah, he just, I mean, I was in Dayton, Ohio, and he was in Beverly Hills, you know, California. So this went on for this. a couple of years when, and I transferred and then I, you know, started studying with him on, on Sundays, but you know, you got, you guys, the listeners can get the book and it in itself is a, um, I mean, I could, I could go on and on about it. I could, I could do the whole book over for you right now. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds absolutely fascinating. I can't wait to hear it. I can't wait to download it and listen to your voice and hear your takeaways. What, what, yeah. how, how, real quick, you have the confidence now. What do you attribute that to? Just your statistics, your, your doingness of it? Um, or what, how did you well, build that? Well, certainly the doingness of, I think I would, I would say that's number one is that I started when I moved out to California and started working with him is within a couple of years that I started auditioning mm -hmm. and I was learning by doing Elena. I didn't know, um, I, I didn't know that I had a, a niche in doing voiceovers that I, I kind of specialize in this area of, of adolescence and young boy sounds. I was rarely cast as a girl. I can count on one hand how many times I've played a girl in casting in 42 years. I don't play girl voices. And there's something about, you know, The Simpsons, I'm Bart, Nelson, Ralph, Kearney, Database. Um, who am I missing? Bart, Nelson, Ralph, oh, Todd Flanders, and Maggie, Maggie Simpson, who doesn't even really talk, but she, you know, she, somebody's got to make the baby sounds, but those other boys that I do, those, <laughs> you know, amazing. it's the challenges. How, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. But the challenge is how do I not sound like them? You mean the different ones? Yeah. How do I, how do I get other, this was a challenge for a long time in my career. The Simpsons took off and I, here I am doing six boy voices, but then, you know, the, a, a, an opportunity came up for me to do, uh, to do Chucky from, from the Rugrats. And I was hired to replace someone who, who was going to retire. And I had to, then it's a little bit of a different thing. Cause I just had to duplicate that sound that was not an original sound of, of my own that was a duplication of what this gal chris cavanaugh had created so that too was just like one of the biggest challenges i think i ever had and i and i go into detail on that too on how you know it's kind of kind of um challenging and odd and um it made my heart um, it made my blood pressure kind of go up a little bit being in the room with these actresses that had been doing the Rugrats 
for eight years at that time. And here I am coming in brand new, but doing this voice. And I felt like I was holding them up because the director who worked with me, who personally worked with me, you know, I don't want to hold everybody up. And I got the agreement from the producers. Why don't we just record me separately for a year and let's just take it one step at a time. That is all. That's oh, crazy to me that Nancy Cartwright, the voice of Bart Simpson, who you'd think would walk into any room and be like not intimidated, goes into another set and feels intimidated ground zero. See, that's fascinating to me. Yeah, but those circumstances are rare. You know, to the, the pressure I've got here I am in in the recording booth and there's a glass pane in front of me and 12 executives on the other side the engineers listening to me do the record or like hearing me do this sound and they're they're sit they're there and some of them aren't even looking at me which is actually a very smart thing to do they just want to hear does that sound like the chucky that uh, that we know and, is this you know, after it, you booked it or while you're auditioning for it? This was, no, it wasn't while... Uh, and did you have to I, audition for it? Well, as far as I know, I was the only one that they called because the Chris, Chris and I had been up for a couple of parts that we had a similar voice, how to say it, kind of the, the mechanism of voice print. I don't know what to call it. Our... Uh, our, our uh, Physiologically, there's a similarity in the sounds that we do. Although I have never heard her, I've never heard anybody that can do Bart Simpson. My sister kind of comes close, but there's a little more to it than just making a sound. There's an energy, and I honestly, I don't think anybody can exactly duplicate an exact sound. People come very close, but there's an attitude that goes behind it. There's a and there's a life and energy. Yeah, it's it's a life energy that I don't think you know. We're all individuals, right? That's pretty. That's a, that's a very. I don't know how to say it. I think that's trying. I'm trying to. It's make like a, a fingerprint. Try, yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. But anyway, I went in, and as far as I know, working with this director, he was really very specific with me and said, you know, I was just trying to make sure that that sound of Bart Simpson didn't bleed over. And every now, because Chucky, this is Chucky, and he sounds like this, and Bart Simpson sounds like that. And they're very similar, except that Chucky's got like a throat, he's got like a constant adenoidal problem. There's like, there's a, it's like a congestion in his throat. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, I kind of, it, it kind of sounds like he has to, I have to blow my nose all the time. <laughs> you know? That is amazing. <laughs> Yeah, and, and Bart doesn't have that, but like in laughing or little things, and he would say, he would say to me, he goes, um, and this was in front of everyone. We 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 made a little cue between us. He would say, um, God, what would he say? He would say, let's let's just let's just tighten it up a little bit, Nance. And when he would say that, what he's really saying to me it sounds a little bit too much like Bart. And I go, got it. And I would then correct it. And it was simple. I was just, I duplicated exactly what he needed and wanted. And I delivered the goods because if I slip, I may not, I wasn't quite aware of that. Wow. You know, and then he could just give me a little cue, not embarrass me, you know, not n really out of respect. And so I can correct it. And then others would just be, oh, yeah, yeah, that's better. That's better. No, they, they were very generous with me. Nice. Those executives, that was the first time that I was brought in. I had been hired and I didn't know they were going to be showing up that day. And it kind of like, wow, the pressure on that, that was amazing. But, you know, it's just that's that's the way it goes. Actors get rejected. We get, you know, we move up, we get awards, we get special gift boxes and bags and, you know, presents and stuff like that. And there's still a lot of judgment. There's a lot of evaluation. There's a lot of putting down. There's a lot of, you know, making actors feel like, and it's not just actors, it's writers too, by the way. And it's musicians. There's just artists in general tend to be targets for people who A, can't do it themselves, right. and they'd rather criticize 
the person that is totally, you know, vulnerable. Yeah, vulnerable and willing and is going to be the, the artist is the one that's going to make this show be successful. You can't do it without talent. Right. And there's a whole pool of us. And it's really kind of an industry where it's, it's very um, collaborative. I am, I'm counting on the writers to write brilliant scripts, you know, so that I can do my job. The singing, I got to say, Bart sings better than Nancy Cartwright, but. Um... <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That is so cool. So when are you going to run the studio? <laughs> well, uh, well, uh, we're, we're trying. No, <laughs> that no, would company. be amazing because, uh, maybe artists would have a little easier of a time. Well, that's a really good question. That's another awesome question because create for you is we're kind of set up that way. It's sort of like a, it is like a mini studio because of the connections that I, I have and Jaime and Carolina, they're, they're Mexican and so is Monica. And we could have been called three Mexicans and a gringa. <laughs> and I love that. I do I too. And then you could get into the Latin American market as well. Well, that's what we do. That actually is our, is our business model. Jaime and Carolina, Jaime, he was just his, his, um, he just produced and had been nominated, not this past one, but two Emmys ago, the show that he worked on, which is Julie and the Phantoms, it got nominated for 13 Emmys and it, it won three of them. Wow. And he, he's been an actor and has kept lines in, in Mexico, South America, Spain, Puerto Rico, and Costa Rica. So all of his and Carolina's lines are in all the Latin, Latin countries. And so, and especially in Mexico. So he's connected up with all these opinion leaders, studio executives, directors, writers, and actors. So he's kind of got that covered. And here I've got the domestic United States covered. So together we've got this company of importing intellectual properties mm. from Mexican and Latino Latinx countries, bring those stories and award-winning successful films, TV shows, and even novels, successful books, bringing them, importing them into America and kind of, I'm going to say Americanizing them, but we're not, we're, we're keeping true to the culture. That is beautiful. Well, I'm excited. Yeah. Nancy for president of <laughs> studios, of Sony, of, you know, I'm ready. Let's go. Um, well, I want to thank you so much for being on today. Fascinating conversation. Love the stories. Can't wait to check out the Audible book. I'm still a 10-year-old boy. I want to hear all the little behind the scenes, plus your takeaways and your tips and, you know, what you've learned throughout the the decades now of being in the industry and being the most oh. successful at your craft is just not many people do what you do plus have the heart that you have and all the lives that you've helped with all of your charities and everything that you're involved with and you're just a role <laughs> model really to the community i think you were even given at one time like honorary mayor of the town <laughs> that you're in i mean but you're not amazing as and i'm glad that you have the accolades you deserve that and a whole bunch more you're oh, you're thank you so so um, impressive in everything that you do. You show up at 100%. And I'm so glad that you were on today because you are a woman in power. Thank you. Oh, Elena, thank you. You're welcome right back. This has been a total pleasure. I, uh, yes, I appreciate it. And thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, see you next episode. Woohoo!